Uh, first, good evening, everyone. We have a really good turnout tonight, it looks like. Uh, it's Thursday, January 7th, uh, 2021. And this special information meeting on the Hazen budget for the next school year is called to order at 6.31 p.m., uh, according to my clock. First of all, on behalf of the Hazen board and the administration, uh, thanks to all of you for being present here uh, tonight. You could be anywhere else on the internet tonight and no one would blame you, but you chose to be here. And we really appreciate that. Uh, now a word about the format of the meeting and the opportunity for public comments. On our agenda, uh, the first order of business listed is public comment, but it seems to make more sense to have that part of the meeting after we present an overview of the budget. So to the Hazen board present, uh, if there's no objection, then by unanimous consent, we'll move the time for public comment to after the budget overview. Uh, Hazen board, do I hear any objections? No. So hearing none, by unanimous consent, the comment period is moved to after the budget presentation and uh, the agenda is so modified. Uh, this meeting is in two parts. The first part will be the presentation of the latest working version of the Hazen, uh, Hazen budget, uh, which has not yet been adopted by the board. We'll ask uh, Brittany Curry to summarize the main points of the budget. And that will be followed by further information from Hazen Principal David Perigo. After the presentation is finished, we'll have a listening session during which you'll have the opportunity to uh, share your views and recommendations concerning the budget with everyone here. This part of the meeting is for the board to listen to your views. The board won't immediately respond to your comments, but we will be thinking about what you're saying. And with the benefit of your comments, we'll be better equipped uh, when we return to working on the budget. Uh, by the way, a copy of the latest uh, working version of the budget is on the Hazen U Union website. Uh, just scroll to the bottom of the opening page to see the link to the budget as it stands. And right below that link, there's another link where you can see uh, the Hazen budget revenues that were available to us uh, over the last five years and the level of student enrollment for the same time. Uh, now about public comment, many of you already know that participating in an online meeting like this is sometimes difficult. It's really, really easy for us to jump on each other's talking and to cut each other off, uh, which makes for a confusing experience. So please mute your microphones, which I see most of you have already done, uh, until it's your turn to talk. We want to hear from as many people as possible. If you would like to comment, please access the chat feature and write your name in the chat window. Uh, Jason will monitor the chat window and keep track of uh, speaking order. And he'll call on you when it's your turn to speak. Uh, for now, please limit your comments to two minutes so we can hear from as many people as possible. If there's time, we can circle back to people uh, who want to speak a couple of minutes more. Um, okay, uh, before we uh, hear about the latest working version of the budget from Brittany and David, uh, may I say that as usual, important things to keep in mind for putting the budget together are the amount of revenue that's available and the impact of uh, the Hazen budget on property taxes. Okay, Brittany, I don't know if I can see you out there, but uh, if you're out there, let's now turn to uh, Brittany and then David for uh, an overview of the latest version of the budget. Brittany, take it away. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm gonna keep my 
video off just to help with the internet service here. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through how we've gotten to where we are, which is not adopted and it's very much not completed. So I wanna make sure that people understand that. When we first started with the budgets this year, um, we were in this current budget we're in, I should start there. We um, found that we are over the threshold amount for the per pupil costs. That was an error that was missed in the last budget cycle. And we realized that um, this early on this fall. So our first goal when putting together this current budget was to get the per pupil cost back in, in line so that the, you all as taxpayers don't have a penalty this year. The amount that we were trying to get to was a $150,000 cut um, in order to get to that point just on the expense side. So on our first draft on Hazen Budget Draft 1.0, that is where we started. On the second draft, the following month, I put the revenue piece together and we've realized on that draft that we had a loss on the revenue side for the fund balance rollover. If you look at your revenue page of the budget draft 2.0, mostly towards the bottom, I have it highlighted in yellow, you'll see it's called transfer from reserves. What that means is it's the fund balance rollover from two years prior. So in education funding, after the year is closed, the audit goes through, whatever monies are left gets allocated to the next budget that is being put together. So in this year's budget, FY21, school year 21, we were using the fund balance that was rolled over from FY19. In the budget we're putting together for FY22, we're using the fund balance that was rolled over from FY20, which is where we just ended in June. That amount is not the same every year, um, which is why you'll see such a drastic drop. There was $307,000 that was allocated to the FY21 budget, and we only had um, $180,000 towards this year that we could have used. So we were already going to lose over $100,000. My recommendation, which this is my first year as the director of finance for OSSU, my recommendation to the board was to put half of that fund balance towards a building maintenance reserve fund. Hazen is the only school in OSSU that does not have a building reserve fund. So I, from the beginning, uh, recommended that they put 50% into a fund to start so we can start working on the building. Um, this fall, we were considering going towards a bond, which was many millions of dollars, and we chose to pull the plug on that because of the financial crisis we're in. But in doing so, we have a building that has some serious needs, and that was where we decided to start with the building maintenance fund. Of course, again, this is a working budget, so that's not um, something set in stone. Which brings us to the first page of the budget, which is the tax calculation. Um, education spending is based on equalized pupils, um, which is off the enrollment. Enrollment for Hazen has drastically gone down in the last five years. And you'll see that if you click on to the five-year revenue page on the very bottom and highlighted, it has the total enrollment and then it, on the next line down, it shows the equalized pupils, which is what your education spending is based on. Hazen's unfortunately lost a lot of enrollment in the last few years. And there's only really two options when you have a lower enrollment. It's either to cut your expenses or your taxes are gonna increase. So the object of this year, um, we were trying to stay under the threshold to make the taxes not have a penalty and not have a huge increase, which is what happened this current year. So that is where we are at right now. Um, and if anyone has any further questions on how the budget is put together, you're welcome to email me as well.
Okay, thanks, uh, Brittany. Um, David Perigo, Hazen Principal, over to you. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> just before I present um, the cuts that we are proposing at this time, um, I wanna make a couple of um, introductory comments. Um, the first of which is I've had numerous conversations over this past week about budget. Um, and it's really a wonderful thing to work in a community where there is so much care, concern, and passion about the schools, uh, the school budget, and the, and the education of our kids. Um, what I wanna say is that every single one of those conversations was respectful and civil. Um, we are a school, we are in the business of educating kids and kids learn from watching adults and what they do and how they conduct themselves in real life situations. Um, so what we experienced this week at Hazen stood in really stark contrast to the modeling that we saw come out of our nation's capital yesterday. And so I am really quite confident that tonight, as we talk about differences and different opinions and ideas, and perhaps even express some passion and some strong emotions about how we feel about things, I'm confident that we're gonna model for our kids, some of whom we have with us tonight in this meeting, um, how a community has those kinds of civil conversations in the work that we do. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, the second thing I wanna say is that in a school budget, and uh, most school budgets are like this, Hazen is no different. The vast portion of the funds that exist in the budget exist in people's salaries. Um, so when we talk about needing to cut significant amounts of money, we're inevitably talking about people. Um, this is a really hard time to be talking about cutting people's salaries and cutting jobs. We all know that this last year of this pandemic has taken a tremendous toll on our communities, on our families, on our livelihoods. And this is the last you know, time that any of us would wanna be engaging in this. The staff at Hazen is awesome. And there's not a single one of them who deserves to lose their job at this time. Um, these are tough times. The theme of this year has seemed to have been no good choices, just a bunch of really bad choices. Um, so as we present this tonight, I want it to be clear that nobody feels good about this. Nobody feels that this is a step towards making Hazen a better, stronger place for our kids. This is all pretty unfortunate that we have to do this. Um, so I have a list of things that are in the current consideration. I will post this in the chat, but only after I'm done presenting it um, as an effort to try and maintain focus in the meeting. So the first thing we did when we were thinking about, um, you know, we had a target figure that we were shooting towards, which was a moving target. And that's also something that's tricky. And Brit uh, Brittany can talk more about this, but the budget figures are, are not something solid. They move and change in, in relationship to a lot of different factors. But the first thing that we did was we looked at non-personnel cuts, cuts that we could make that wouldn't impact people's jobs. So we started with a 32% instructional supply cut across the board. We then cut uh, a chunk of, uh, money from tech supplies. And then we went into the maintenance budget and cut from a maintenance budget for professional services in there. So those were three areas that we tried to find some funds in and we cut in those areas. And then we had to move to where most of the money was, which is in, um, in the positions that we have in the school. So we started with administration. We currently have three full-time members of our administration team, and we are cutting one of those full-time positions. So we're reducing the size of the administrative team from three to two. Um, the second cut that we're making is we're reducing one of our behavioral specialist positions. 
So we have two of those positions and we're cutting one of them. So we're going from two to one. Um, the next thing we did was we cut one of our school-based clinician positions. We have three school-based clinicians in the, in the budget and we cut uh, to two. So we went from three to two. Um, then we looked at our custodial budget and we cut a half a position from our custodial budget. So currently we have four and a half positions there and we're cutting from, um, from four and a half to four. Then we looked at our food service budget and we cut a half a position there and we reduced from four um, full-time jobs there to uh, three and a half. Then we started looking at our uh, educational areas and we looked at our science budget and we're cutting a half a position out of our science budget. We currently have four and a half science positions in the school and so we're going from four and a half to four. Um, and we took a look at our um, unified arts positions, um, which include uh, a variety of different things that have to do with primary electives that students take in the school. And we looked at our design tech program and we were cutting a half position there. So we're reducing one full-time position to a half, half-time position there. Um, we looked at our music department and we have two full-time people there currently we're proposing cutting one half-time position so we would have one and a half positions in music and uh the same is in in art um that we are uh cutting from two positions that we currently have to one and a half positions um so that's where we currently stand um it doesn't quite get us to reduce the budget um, under the threshold at this point, but it moves us much closer there. Um, and um, the last thing that I wanna emphasize is that these budget cuts indicate only reluctance. Uh, all of these are important. We are not saying that we value any particular program area over any other at this point. These decisions were made about where we felt we could best handle a bad option. Um, so I will, I will put this in the chat so that people can have it as a reference and can look at it. But that's pretty much from it for me and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Steve. Uh, Steven, it's Jason DiGiulio. It looks like there may be a problem with people attempting to get in, uh, as we seem to be capped at 100 participants. So I'm watching the chat, and I'll be capturing the chat after the meeting's done. And it looks like the meeting's being recorded for those that can't get in. But, um, you know, I wonder if people can make their comments and maybe make room for others to allow people to get in. And I'll continue to watch the chat and get the speaking order for you. Okay, very good. We'll, we'll get back to you in just a second uh, to start the speaking order. On my screen, in terms of the public comments, uh, I see a lot of phone ins, and uh, I don't think you can access the chat screen from the phone. That's so, correct. So, Jason, I'll ask you, uh, after we get done with the uh, people who have requested to speak on the chat screen, uh, I would suggest maybe I can go through uh, and see all the uh, telephone links. I'll call out the last couple of numbers of the telephone link. And whoever's there, um, if you want to speak, please say your name. Uh, and then I'll go to the next telephone link and ask the same question. And I'll hopefully get through all the telephone links and uh, by that method, learn uh, who wants to make a comment. Uh, unless anyone has a, a better idea. That's, uh, that's my immediate uh, uh, solution to figuring out uh, who uh, that is calling in uh, wants to speak. Uh, uh, yes, Orise, I must tell you, uh, before we go back to Jason, I've been on the board for about four or five years now, and we usually have the information session 
required by law after we adopt the budget uh, a few days before town meeting. And in the last four or five years, there have been less than a handful of people at those meetings other than the ones who had to be there. So this is great. And um, it, I see in the chat room that uh, 100 is the limit on the free account. And this may be uh, the start of a, a trend to have uh, these meetings, these uh, extra special meetings uh, online. And uh, perhaps it's worth shelling out uh, to get more capacity. All right, I've tried to uh, stall as long as I could. Uh, Jason, can you start calling on uh, people who wish to make a comment? And I'll just remind you that the board's duty here is to listen to what you're saying, listen to what you're telling us so that we'll be better equipped when we go back to uh, working on the budget. So we won't respond to you right away. All right, Jason, over to you. All right. Um, all right, so Stephen, David, um, first, if you could look at the sharing settings on that document yeah. and open it up to everybody while we get started on the speaking. Okay. And then it looks like first up is Mr. Ross. And then um, Miss Beckley, if you could just let me know if the sharing works, give me a thumbs up or something in chat saying that the sharing is open. And Mr. Ross. And then uh, Mr. Adams. Great. I learned early on to always try to be the first to go. Thank you for allowing, can you hear me if I'm? Yeah. Okay. Um, Jim, excuse me just a second. Can somebody check that new posting of the link that I put in at 652 just to tell me if, that, that you can access it now? Looks like it does not work, David, the link yet. All right, so I'm struggling with trying to get this up then. All I'm right, share it with me as an editor, David, and I can work on it. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry, Mr. Ross. That's fine. All set. You can still hear me. Yep. Great. Right. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak with you this evening. My name is Jim Ross. I have dedicated 32 years of my teaching career to the OSSU district and the Hazen Union community as a design and technology education instructor. I love working at Hazen. And more importantly, I love teaching design and technology education to our student population. I see our shop as the engine which powers our whole school curriculum, a central part to the overall success of our school. Each year, teachers and students from various content areas continuously come to the shop asking for assistance on numerous projects that need materials, tools, tool assistance, or instructions on how to proceed with their content area projects. I'm always happy to assist as many teachers and students with these active explorations. The design and technology education curriculum is an inquiry-based, project-oriented, hands-on learning. The curriculum is place-based education designed to connect what students are taught in core classes to real-world applications. The hands-on learning approach matches the complexities of real life and is taught through an integral interdisciplinary and project-based approach where all students learn how to apply knowledge content to an actual project. Furthermore, the design and technology education curriculum aligns with all of our school-wide goals. Take a moment to think about our current list of school-wide initiatives. Learner agency through reflective practice. What could be a better place to foster this school-wide goal than having students work as partners solving self-directed problems with hands-on, minds-on projects anchored in a tool-rich environment? Future development of our arts academy. The shop and its tools and machinery provide an excellent facility for students to explore the behind-the-scenes technical aspects of theater, set design, and construction. Flexible pathways, independent based learning, personal learning plans. Each of these initiatives are easily anchored with the student choice and voice within the context of our shop. Finally, embedding social emotional learning. Students who suffer from traumatic experiences often struggle with their ability to self regulate with typical classroom settings. The shop environment and the opportunity for hands-on learning 
often provides a calming effect for many of these students. I cannot tell you the number of times I have witnessed students who struggle to engage in other classrooms often find success in our shop environment. Through the endless project opportunities students have to pursue their passions and creative ideas in my shop classroom. I'm committed to providing a safe working space in order for them to achieve success. A space where students have the chance to learn lifelong skills that can be applied to real world applications and career choices. And mostly, and most importantly, a space where the goals set by the board are continuously met. As stated at the outset, the shop is the engine which powers our whole school. As hard as these decisions may be, please don't drain the oil from the engine. Instead, make every attempt to maintain a healthy engine and power us into the future by keeping the design and technology education teaching position at full time. Thank you very much once again for taking my time to listen to me. All right, thank you, Mr. Adams. Thank you. Uh, my name is Will Adams. Uh, I teach at Hardwick Elementary School. I currently am the president of the Orleans Southwest Education Association, representing the teachers and the support staff in all of the schools throughout the OSSU. Um, <clears throat> let me start by, by acknowledging uh, the hard work that the board has to do. Um, there's, at the risk of stating the obvious, these are difficult times and I don't envy the difficult decisions that you need to make. Not surprisingly, um, any time that we are faced with having to reduce the number of teachers or support staff in our schools, um, not surprisingly, the association would have concerns about that. But there's no more time when, there, there's no time that I can think of where students and families need the support and the consistency of the teachers and the support staff that they have than now. Um, I will admit I've not had the opportunity to look at the budget numbers closely. I don't know what the tax implications are um, in terms of the tax rate. But I think it's important that we acknowledge that we don't know what the long-term ramifications of this pandemic are going to be for our children and our families. I look at the elementary school students that I teach that we feed into Hazen. And when I listen to Mr. Haas talk about kind of the safe haven that he provides outside of um, the traditional regular ed classroom, that resonates with me because I was one of those kids. And I see kids in my classrooms um, that benefit for, from, from that type of education. I understand that you have a hard job to do, but it's deeply concerning to us that in a time when students and families need the dedicated teachers and support staff that are serving this community, that through what I'm understanding to be in part a budgeting error should cause the loss of jobs and cause the loss of the quality staff and teachers that are providing um, the consistency and the education for our kids every day. That's deeply concerning to us. Um, I understand that this is I'm hopeful that this is your first of many meetings about this budget. Um, and I'm hopeful that in the coming weeks, we can find more details about how this came to pass and what some potential solutions might be other than cutting the most important people that our kids have right now outside of their families. And that's their dedicated teachers and support staff. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's the end of the people that have requested to speak via chat, Stephen. So you might start on your OLM and then your phone numbers, it looks like. 
Hi. Um, I just want to. Oh, and Larry. Okay. I just want to speak in support of my colleagues. Um, you know, when all of this began at the end of March, the way that the teachers and the support staff turned on a dime to keep schools open and keep it going and try new things um, and check in with kids who are falling off the radar sometimes every day. We've been told that we're essential workers, that even though it's dangerous and everyone else needs to just stick to their own families. We come into work every day and essentially we are in multi-family situations every day, um, tr even though it might be unsafe. And I feel like that has a lot of sacrifice. People have missed holidays with their families. They've missed the ability to do things other people get to do because they can choose to take work off, but we have to show up and we want to show up. We want to be there for the kids. And so then to thank these essential workers by taking away their jobs, we know that 40% of Americans are one paycheck away from poverty. So to thank our teachers and our support staff as essential workers by taking away their jobs just seems ironically ludicrous to me. But really, I think one thing that we can all agree on is that this is about the kids. And the kids have lost so much this year um, from the time that this started. So I just wanna echo what Will is saying that on top of all of that, to take away a trusted adult that we are providing them with, who is checking on them, making sure that they get a good education. David began the year emphasizing how much the most important thing is our relationships with students and our social and emotional connections to students that takes priority over all else this year. And so I don't see how taking away the people that are important to them is going to fulfill that district-wide goal. So that's what I wanted to say, is that we need to make the cuts elsewhere. And out of everything that the kids have lost, we can't ask them to lose the people that are helping them as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. So Jennifer and then Suzanne. Yes, hi. Um, so I'm... This, this feels a little skewed um, that there's two halftime positions proposed to being cut from the arts. Um, I was under the impression that there was going to be a cut from the PE department um, that I know was considered to be a, a place where they could cut several years ago when we had fewer, uh, more, excuse me, more students than we have now. So I'm curious why this is so skewed, cutting two halftime positions from the arts. And um, I think the only other department that was being cut was a halftime position in science. Um, it seems like this should be a little bit more balanced between departments. I understand the difficulty here and needing to make these cuts, uh, but I think they just need to be a little more balanced. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gann? Uh, hi. Um, I guess my basic statement is that I feel we need to invest in our schools now in order to attract families and students to want to stay here in Hardwick and also to move here. And investing now uh, means that in the future, that tax rate and that burden will be decreased. I know from experience uh, five, no, six or seven years ago when I was the business manager for the district, um, Craftsbury took that kind of mentality and said, hey, we're gonna invest in our school. We are committed to keeping a school here in this town. and." We are willing to go over that per pupil threshold now and understand that that's, that's something we're going to do. And they took it to the taxpayers with that in mind and were very direct and open about it. And the taxpayers said, yes, we agree. We want to do that. We want to invest in our kids, our future, our town. Um, and that's what I want to see here. These, these cuts are just too much, way too much in every area and I don't want to say that I think that there's there's never room for cuts because you know we know with, with fewer pupils that there is probably opportunity to consolidate classes um, although with COVID and distancing requirements I don't know how you'd be able to meet that I don't know how you'd be able to meet these maintenance cuts with COVID requirements and sanitization needs it just feels um, not realistic it feels unfair to teachers, but unfair to students. And 
families in our town and it's not it's not good i i urge the board to reconsider and uh, look at a budget that will go over that threshold because our, our kids are that important and we need to do this for them. Thank you. Daisy? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that I really agree with Jennifer and Leanne. Um, I was a former Hazen graduate. I graduated in 2017 and I'm about to graduate from UVM. Um, and I just wanted to say that the most important time in my education at Hazen, uh, the most important thing to me was my professors, my teachers, my experiences and relationships with those teachers and with those professors. Um, and I just think that I agree with Jennifer, how she was talking about that it does seem to be a pattern that the arts are often one of the first positions to be cut um, in a lot of previous years as well. In other board meetings that I've sat in on, it does seem like the arts are constantly being um, proposed for cuts. And I was under the impression as well that perhaps um, an athletics position may be may be under consideration for a cut and i'm not saying that that's what we need or want that's obviously not a great choice either but um it does seem skewed as jennifer was saying that um there are two arts positions up for being cut and um only one from any other place um and i just wanted to also say that you know cutting a position anywhere especially um two positions within the arts and music means you're putting more stress on the one full-time person or you know maybe the two full-time people that will be there um, and that makes it so that other students don't have those maybe not have as many opportunities to work as closely with those professors because it's just too much for one person to do um, and i did write a letter to the board as well stating that you know these cuts are going to make lost moments for students and for a lot of students any one of those lost moments could be the one moment they really needed to push them through um, to graduate speaking from personal experience if i had lost any of those relationships i might not be um, where i am today i might not be graduating from uvm without my without my professors and the help of of my teachers at hazen thank you thank you anya Wow, um, thank you, Daisy. It's good to see you and thank you for sharing that. Um, I, Suzanne, I wanna say thank you for what you shared. We cannot afford to, to cut any personnel. If anything, we need to invest in more people to connect with our students. Um, we talk constantly about trauma responsive um, approach to teaching, which we desperately need and we will need more as the time goes on. Um, I don't have to tell you this, and whether it's arts, whether it's PE, whether it's unified arts, it doesn't matter. It's the relationships and the different ways of relating to stu students that are that are key. It's not not the the, the curriculum. It's the relationship. Um, uh, but the other thing that nobody has mentioned yet that I really really want to point out is uh, it's not only the teaching positions um, that are important. We have staff who are running our school who are just as, if not even more important. And uh, I don't know how our kitchen staff does what they do, how our maintenance staff, how they do what they do with the staff and they have right now. If we take more people away, um, I mean, they're the ones who run our school, uh, who take care of us, who take care of our kids. Um, I just really want to speak in, on behalf of them as well as my, my other colleagues. So please take that in consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Talon Bryant, Talon. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, and um, I just wanna start and, and just clarify, it's, it's uh, uh, Jim Ross's position is also in the Unified Arts Department. So there's actually three positions in the arts that are uh, being considered. Um, I just want to share with everybody and, and make sure everyone knows what we have here in the community um, in our music department um, and I mean also our the rest of our arts department but I just want to share some highlights from our, our, our music department 
so so we know what we have um our our program um is is very a pretty high achieving program um that can keep up with programs from around the state and um that that's not that's not an accident it, it you know we have we've had two hardworking music faculty um it, at the secondary level at, at, at hazen in our district that um have been willing to to take these things on and push our kids um our kids i mean we've had as many as 10 kids going to all state at a time um uh which is you know there's there's several music festivals that we participate in we've had six kids at the new england music festival um we've had 20 to 25 kids at the district music festival um and and these are auditions things these are things that our students are competing at and achieving um again it's no accident it, it's also the schedule it's also giving adequate time to deliver uh quality instruction it's access to the students to provide the the high quality lessons that they need to be able to do these things and we have the, the faculty to do that and i think that i think as a community you know i'm very proud to be able to serve the students in the community and be able to to offer these things to kids um having less than two teachers will greatly impact the ability to be able to offer these things um and i, I really think that the music department is is one of the uh, places in our school that's the face uh not just in our local community but around the state of vermont around new england um we are the smallest school that participates at the uh annual acda madrigal festival which is a beautiful event held in burlington every year and um we are frequently um other professionals in our community are commenting on how how well our students do um so we I, I view music in our school i think as it is uh, amongst other programs i think is a strength um i think that music should be the center of a student's education i think we currently we serve 98 percent of the population if you include the general music classes in the middle school um and our the national average for participation in music ensembles is 10 around 10 percent we serve well over that around uh last year uh, our numbers currently i think don't, don't reflect uh what has been but we we've had um in the chorus we had 46 47 students and in the um the middle the the high school band um i think uh had around 15 to 20. so it's um and we're offering guitar and piano classes. I just really think that that music should be at the center of the kids' um, education. Music ser uh, serves as a form of self-discovery that goes beyond just the elective of music. Um, and I think that it offers, uh, there's a therapeutic benefit to this that um, many students choose to access. And I think that moving from one point from two to 1.5 positions in music and um as well as art are really greatly going to hinder the amount of electives we can offer these kids and greatly impact the amount of much needed um therapeutic benefits and self-discovery that i think that our students need um frequently the auditorium has been it, In students' lives, they have a community and a place to support each other. And I really believe that our music department should and is at the heartbeat of our school. So before we choose to, to, to cut down these positions, uh, I, I really th think we should um, consider uh, what we want our school to look like and how we want our, to share uh, haste uh, the local Yeah. All right, Mr. Bryant, looks like it's not quite working. All right, thank you. Ms. Foster? Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for your all that we are hearing. 
Um, it's definitely a wonderful conversation. I obviously am going to advocate for the position at food service. Um, just some information um, when we closed in March on you know the amount of meals that we prepared on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, Mondays and Wednesdays were over 500. On Friday, we're over 200 meals, uh, all which were done with the help of, of two paras along with the food service staff at Hazen. Also new this year to us um, is the snow closures. Um, if, if school is canceled the day before, the expectation is that we will have meals ready for the students as they leave our building because they won't be in the next day for um, snow closure, which will be a remote day. And of course you have to have food um, service when there is school. So not only will we be expected to provide the meals for the day at hand, we will also be packaging the meals to take home for the students to have the next day. As we all know, food is very important and right now, extremely important. Um, three hour position is a hard position to fill. If we, if we lose it, you know, it's, it's in the middle of a day. It's not a convenient time for people to think they want to work 10 to one. Um, so again, I'm advocating for the position in food service I'm asking the board to please consider keeping it. Um, I, I advocate for all the positions. Um, it's been a crazy time for everybody. And I, I, as, as a taxpayer, I understand the difficulty, but I do agree with Suzanne, if we don't invest, um, where will we be in five years? Um, again, thank you all very much for your time and for the school board and admin for these tough decisions that they are trying to make. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, Steven, it looks like, uh, has anybody posted in the chat that they would like to speak that I missed? I recognize it's moving quickly and I'm trying to also make sure that the other window can see us. So if I missed anyone, can you just re-put your name in there? I think I right. saw Victoria Van Hestert's name appear. Okay, thank you. Victoria? Hi, I'm here, I think. <laughs> yep. Um, I just want to say thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you to the board for offering this opportunity to comment on a very difficult budget. Um, I know this might not be the norm. I know from past board life for myself, it's not ordinarily how things happen. So I'm, I'm really grateful that you have opened up this opportunity for all of us to participate. Um, I also want to agree with what Suzanne and Jen Fliegelman pointed out that I feel that some of the proposed cuts are a little bit heavy on one side. Um, I think that the arts at Hazen are one of the things that define it as a school. And I'd, I'd be sad to see those programs suffer over time because we didn't have the foresight to invest in them now. Um, related to that, I'd also add that there's been a lot of talk about the pandemic impact and how everything happened in March. And I'm, I'm concerned that in, in this current crisis that it's easy for us to get wrapped up in what this moment is instead of looking at the bigger five-year picture that you presented in that information about declining enrollment, declining revenue, and all of these things are not going to go away just because we solve this one problem now. They are going to continue to exist. Our enrollment is not suddenly going to have another 60 kids or 80 kids that might help make it easier for Hazen to function with the budget we all want to see. So I would encourage the board to consider over the next year or so engaging in a process similar to what Craftsbury engaged in years ago of community listening sessions to find out exactly what the Hazen community, and that includes not just Hardwick, but Greensboro and Woodbury, um, what they envision for their high school and how, how we can really create it to, to be what we all want it to be, not just what administration 
student imagines, what, what teachers imagine, but what all of us imagine, that includes the business community as well. And I think that's why it worked for Craftsbury because they had full buy-in from everybody. And so when they went to say, we're going to do this, it was easier for the community to get behind it because they had participated in a process of visioning, envisioning what they wanted their school to be. And I think that sometimes there's a tendency for us to, to be stuck in a budget position that's really uncomfortable and only react to it. We're always reacting instead of planning. And I, I love, I know as a former board member, that's really, really hard to do, but I would, I would encourage the board to consider undertaking that in the, in the coming months, once you're past this, to really figure out what direction you would like Hazen to go, as we know that the numbers aren't suddenly going to get better in a year or two years or three years. So we're not in the same position again next year and the year after. So thanks again and happy new year. Thank you. Um, it looks like James Lockhart, Mr. Lockhart. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for letting me talk. I don't have anything prepared. Uh, Jim and Talon said most of it, but I'd just like to say that um, I've had so many kids over the years tell me that the art class was the only reason they were coming into school. And when they transition somebody uh, into the school, taking one class, it's always an art class or a hands-on class. I can't tell you how many kids I've taught to the ruler because I, I'm always aghast that they, how they don't know the ruler after being in math class so long, but they don't know from seventh graders to 12th graders. But when they start to apply these things as we do in our class, um, it's, we do teach them. And with the arts, it's where all the other content is applied. And it's where innovation and creativity comes from. And America, of course, everyone's talking about that's, that's the next thing that we need the most of all is innovation and creativity to compete in this world. So I just wanted to, uh, to express that, that, the, that these electives are, uh, are very important to these students in this school. Some of them wouldn't come to school at all if it wasn't for their electives. Thank you. Thank you. And so Stephen, um, I was posting things from the other meet as they come in, but you can see those in the chat. They're sort of questions. And I think you said your protocol was if people can respond to those, they do, but there might not be an opportunity for direct question and answer tonight, but instead listening. And then we'll all collect all these questions and make sure the board gets them as part of the chat. Is that how you want to handle that? Uh, that's right. That would be useful. Thank you, Jason. But at this point, I'd like to uh, go through the uh, telephone callers that I see on my screen. Uh, and I don't know if I can get to the telephone callers at the other meeting, which somebody has miraculously uh, initiated. Thank you, whoever did that. Um, so what I'd like to do now is to read out the last two numbers of the uh, telephone callers that I see on my screen. And if you want to speak, please say your name. If you don't want to speak, you don't have to say anything. I'll just wait a little while and then go on to the next uh, number. Um, and then after we go through, it looks like one, two, three, there's five numbers that I have access to. After uh, I go through all those uh, five numbers to uh, see who's interested in speaking, then we'll, we'll go to you in turn and then we'll go from there. Okay, so here's the first uh, telephone caller I see. Last two numbers are 2-2. Two, two. Are you interested in making a comment? If not, you don't have to say anything. Okay, I, I presume uh, no comment from telephone number uh, ending in 2-2. Two, two. The next one is uh, telephone number ending in 1-3. Uh, caller with the last two numbers, 1-3. Uh, please let us know uh, if you're interested in making a comment by saying your name. Uh, you don't have to say anything if you don't want to make a comment. Uh, 
Okay, uh, hearing nothing, we'll move on to the next number. The last two uh, numbers from the, last, uh, from the next caller is 8-1. Uh, caller with last two numbers, 8-1. Would you like to uh, make a statement or share your views? You don't have to say anything if you don't want to. All right, moving on to the next caller. Last two numbers ending in zero, zero. Uh, would you like to make a comment? Uh, if you don't, you can stay silent. The next caller has uh, last two numbers. Well, go ahead, please. Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. This is Michael Carr. Mike, it took me a while to unmute and figure out how to do that. So maybe some of the earlier folks were also struggling with it. Yeah, I uh, hope Mike, they, they break in if that's the case. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you all. Um, I've been on the board myself. I know the challenges you're facing, so greatly appreciated. <clears throat> I put a, a question in the chat, and it could be directed maybe to Brittany or somebody in the admin side. It doesn't have to be on the board side. But there's a line item of an increase of 515000 in salaries. Uh, is there the capacity to sort of have a background uh, fill-in on what is behind that uh, 30 some odd percent increase. Is that uh, possible? Thank you. Uh, Brittany, if you're still out there, that sounds like uh, a question you may have uh, addressed uh, in your um, opening statement. <laughs> There we go. Got it fixed. Sorry, everybody. Um, okay, I'm Brittany. looking at the Hazen document, and I don't see that number. There was an incorrect um, item that was put on the website that was taken down, and I'm wondering if it's from that. If you want to look at the title on your document to see if it says Hazen or OSU ESD, that might be the OSU ESD budget. Is that something you can check, Michael? Uh, I'm still trying to figure this out. Yeah, I'll look into it. It was the OSSU one, if that's an incorrect uh, budget that's up there. Um, that's great. I appreciate it. And I'll dig in a little deeper. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next uh, caller with uh, last two numbers, three, four. Last two numbers, three, four. Caller with those last two numbers, if you'd like to uh, make a statement, uh, please uh, tell us your name. Uh, if you don't want to make a statement, uh, you don't have to say anything. Uh, I don't hear anything. And uh, it looks like I've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, tiles on my screen but i can read the telephone numbers uh in the chat list and they seem to be listed first that's all the telephone numbers uh i see uh and then i see uh jason kim beckley uh yes so miss beckley would be up next if you're set with the phone stephen yes i am i think all right miss kim Hi, everyone. Um, I have many hats attending this meeting. I live in Hardwick. I'm a taxpayer. I also teach in the district at three of the elementary schools as a music teacher. I'm also part of the union. Um, but I wanted to speak first from my perspective as a taxpayer. Um, as a taxpayer in Hardwick, I would prefer to have schools that are fully funded, fully staffed, and are able to meet the needs of our students and meet the needs of our town and the future of our town than to cut these positions. Um, and also from an educator's perspective, I've been on multiple interview committees 
And it's really hard to attract and to keep people in half-time positions. They will eventually leave and look for full-time positions instead of staying here. So then you'll take the amazing people that are working here and have people that might not be able to contribute as much or might not be as dedicated by cutting these positions. Thank you. All right, looks like uh, Ted Gates has joined with a question and that's, uh, I saw Ms. Beckley was the last on the speaking list, Stephen. Uh, right, um, I'm looking at uh, your question, uh, Ted, and uh, negotiations uh, with the uh, Teachers Association are still outstanding and uh, we don't have enough information to uh, respond to your question at that point until uh, we do make an agreement. Thank you, Steve. I don't see uh, any other names, uh, Jason. Uh, do you? Right, I do, but I notified the um, facilitator of the other chat, Casey Potter, that we have seven slots over here in case anyone in the other chat would like to come in and ask a question or make a statement. So we'll see if any. Um, and then it looks like Ms. Fliegelman wants to speak again while people may be joining. Is that okay with you, Stephen? Sure. Thank you. Um, I just want to add quickly, <clears throat> excuse me, I understand where the board is, the position that they're in trying to balance um, the budget with the need to, you know, to provide a good education for the kids with the need to maintain a, a reasonable tax rate. Um, I just wanted to say I was on the hardwood board for five years and we were in that position several times, of course. Um, and we were able to pass a budget increase. Um, you know, if there is appropriate, if there's education to the public, people get out the word and let people know what's going on. What is at risk of being cut if the budget doesn't pass? You know, overall, the town is supportive of our towns are supportive of our kids and our schools. And, you know, I don't think we need to make such a substantial cut. I think we can get a budget passed with enough community outreach to let people know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, Jason, I hope the people in the other uh, meeting um, can hear me. Uh, if you do, uh, as Jason mentioned, there are seven slots open in the main meeting. Uh, please jump in if you can uh, to ask a question if you wish. Uh, but of course, we'll still take uh, questions relayed uh, to us to the uh, chat feature. Um, So let's just uh, stand by for a minute or two to allow people uh, to join uh, from the other group. Well, uh, Stephen, there's another question about the tax rate. Did you say that was answered on the budget document? You referenced a document that has the tax rate attached to the budget. Is that what you were saying you had earlier? Yeah, I think uh, at least as of uh, this morning, uh, on the Hazen Union website, on the opening page, I think you have to let the video load for a little bit. But if you scroll down, you'll see a link to the uh, proposed Hazen budget for the next school year. And if you click on that link, um, I, I think you'll see that information highlighted. There's, there's a, a special part uh, of that screen that shows the uh, projected tax impact, at least the best that we know it at this time. Uh, I see it's, that uh, link has just been Posted. Is that what you just posted? Uh, uh, yes, Stephen. That's I just pulled your document and linked it there. Great. Okay. 
I think it's there. Uh, uh, please take a look at that uh, screen. Uh, but recall that this is still a working budget, not final yet. And um, there's still the matter of uh, uh, meeting with the uh, Teachers Association to come to some kind of uh, resolution uh, of our negotiations. And I see a helpful uh, link from uh, Brittany uh, in the chat room. All right, well, it's been a couple of minutes and a little more, and I don't think uh, people have been joining from uh, the other hosted meeting. May I speak again? Right. Right, yeah, Mr. Ross is requesting to speak again. Sure. Um, I really wanted to, uh, I've been a resident and I've lived in Craftsbury for 35 years now, which is also a part of the OSSU. So I've been very active or understanding the process in which that the Craftsbury Academy went through in regards to what Suzanne was talking about. Um, for a number of years, uh, it was a downward spiral for the Craftsbury Academy. They had to make a cut after another cut after another cut, and each one of those cuts severely impacted the quality and the interest of that school. And I think they reached sort of a rock bottom point, as Suzanne mentioned, where the, the school and the community had to make a decision to say, are we gonna either have an academy here or we are not gonna have an academy? And so they reached a breaking point as a result of multiple cuts over several years that eroded the quality of their school. And at which point, I think many community members came to the conclusion that we want to have this school in our community. And they didn't really reflect on the cost of what that took in order to anchor that school into their community. And I can see a very similar pattern developing here at Hazen as well. It was only about four or five years ago that as a result of lower enrollment that we cut several positions throughout the school. When I look at this list that I'm seeing that uh, is provided, these are a lot of cuts that are gonna occur if they were to go through. And once again, it's a downward spiral. Whereas when you have less things and less choices for students, less people are interested in joining your school. And so I think it is a very careful balance between trying to find what taxpayers will, will uh, approve and also a balance between what is a quality school and what do we want our community to be. And so I think what Suzanne was saying was very important, her comments in regards to the example of Craftsbury Academy. So I just want to really severely keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. All right, looks like uh, Kay Freedy came in from the other meeting and then Ms. Gann wants to speak again. So Ms. Freedy. Yeah, I just had questions as we're looking at maybe some different solutions than um, budget cuts all over the place necessarily. Um, it, it, and I also may have missed this in the being in the other meeting zone, but. I'm wondering if there's any possibility or if there are very clear impossibilities, things that are not possible at this point in terms of the state possibly changing any calculations, um, you know, COVID circumstances and numbers of pupils. I'm wondering if there are any differences in the way that they may be looking at this for the upcoming budget or the year that will impact that budget. Um, and also wondering if there may be any possibilities for COVID relief funds that would try to help stop the gap a little bit. I know those things would be short term, but it may be something, I'm just wondering if that has been considered and if there's anything that may be possible or impossible either way. Thanks. Thank you. And Stephen Miss Gans asking to speak again. Is it all right if Suzanne goes? Uh, I Sure, unless uh, Br Brittany is out there and uh, she is, I think, most tuned into the uh, state of uh, the state education department uh, uh, and, and what their thoughts are in terms of financing uh, for this upcoming year, which is 
last time I checked, a real puzzle. Um, so unless Brittany jumps in, uh, Kay, I'll say that um, that is yet to be determined. That is yet to be determined. All right. I yeah, sorry, I have a, an infant here. <laughs> um, but I can say the only thing from the state to do with COVID for the equalized pupil is that they have frozen the ADM, which is a which is part of the equation of the equalized people so that schools couldn't lose the ADM from last year, but it is a two year rolling average. Those numbers haven't come out as final yet. So that's still up in the air as far as um, the numbers for the state. And as far as the waiting goes, there's a waiting study being done at the state, but that's not going to affect the FY22 equalized pupil numbers as well. And lastly, to as far as CARES Act money or COVID money, there's new money that just barely came out from the federal government. That's money that's very unclear as of right now. The money that we've already gotten has already been allocated, but I don't have any clear picture for next year's grants money yet. Thanks, I, I hope that's responsive, Kay. Uh, uh, Jason, back to you uh, with the next uh, uh, comment. All right. Uh, that would be Miss Gann again, if it's fine. Yep. Uh, thank you again. Uh, everybody is saying some really important things, and I'm sure you guys will have so much to think about. Uh, one of the things that I felt was really strong was what Mr. Lockhart said about uh, the students being excited and, and uh, feeling that they come to school uh, for those classes. And I, you know, sometimes it's, it, it's kind of cruddy to think about it that way, but that's very true. I mean, just mentioning to my son that Mr. Ross might get cut, it was really upsetting to him. So um, I just want to say uh, the last meeting, I was looking at some information from the, the principal, and one of his reports talked about the concern over the dropout rate. And if you cut positions like this, positions that students get excited about coming to school for, uh, classes that they get excited about coming to school for, what Daisy said about um, the arts, you know, when she was in chorus and drama and all of those things, uh, they're vital to kids and it makes them want to come to school and face the, the difficult things like math and science and reading. It makes them excited for their day and it makes them come home happy. And it, it's just, it's just really vital. And I would, I, as a, a taxpayer, a mother, um, somebody very interested in this, would rather the board present to the taxpayers a budget that meets all of these students' needs and is a higher tax rate and, and face the consequence of it maybe failing than present a budget to, a, to the taxpayers that doesn't meet student needs and failing because of that. That's all. Thank you. And it looks like Daisy is requesting to speak again. Please go ahead, Ms. Reyes. Thank you. I just wanted to recap again and just say that um, I think it's really important that we think about the lasting implications that a decision like this can make. Um, you know, I am no longer a student at Hazen Union, but I very strongly and I have very strong feelings about these cuts um, just because of the relationships that I had with the people in that building. Um, I can still tell you the names of people that might not even work there anymore. Like Wendy was a part of our custodial services and she was just a bright light every day. Um, she's, you know, she's not a teacher, um, but she was just as important as a lot of other people in that building to me on days where my ride was late or I needed a cell phone to call my parents. Um, you know, she was there. She offered me her company. She offered me her smile and her warmth. Um, Patty Foster, vegetarian, she uh, she would make me special meals um, and she always did it with a smile on her face. She was always a bright light at that, in that uh, line for lunch and always a joy to see every day. Um, all of these people, uh, Miss Pfeffer was a professor to me and a personal mentor to me as well. Um, Talon Bryant was also a mentor and a teacher to me. All of these people have made my time at Hazen and beyond Hazen, 
very um, has been very influential in that. And while I'm no longer a student at Hayes and Union, those relationships are what I hold closest to me. Um, and those are still relationships that power my everyday functions, my everyday activities. So I think back on the lessons that these people have taught me in that building and outside of that building, and I use those every single day. I can't tell you every lesson that I had in any individual class. I can't tell you um, what I might have learned in geometry, which I was never very good at. Um, but I can tell you that the personal lessons that they taught me, the personal, um, you know, my characteristics, my my personality, a lot of that, who I am today comes from those people and the relationships that I had with them. And I think it's very, very important that we consider the long lasting effects of cutting positions like this and thus cutting out potential relationships that students would have with these people because I have taken that beyond my time at Hazen and it has made me a stronger community member, a stronger person and a stronger student in my current um, location at the University of Mott. So I've taken those lessons and I've used them in my future. Um, and those are the most important things to me are the relationships with these people. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I, th I think uh let's see i think that's everybody so far Stephen. okay let's uh let's wait about a minute uh just in case uh we have another uh commentator who wants to share their views and uh while we're waiting for that and if there there is nothing else then we'll we'll move to close the meeting um but I just want to say again, this is phenomenal, the turnout we had for this meeting. Uh, I'll repeat again at the risk of being a bore, but in the last four or five years, we've had less than a handful of people at information meetings, other than the ones that had to be there. Um, you know, if there's kind of a silver lining to COVID, um, this is it. This is fantastic. You can stay at home and enjoy these meetings from the comfort of your own living room. Uh, Jason, I see somebody else. Uh, yes, uh, Lucas Whitaker, Stephen. Lucas? Yeah, um, hello. Um, I'm no longer a student at Hazen. Um, last year was my only year at Hazen, but I moved here across the country and I found comfort, a home away from home, and I made um, outstanding, probably lifelong relationships with people through the arts at Hazen. Um, I've been to, I believe, seven different schools in my life, and um, Hazen was, had the best arts department that I've ever been a part of. Um, I had a really rough time last year. Uh, my father had stage four cancer and he passed away earlier this summer. And it was those teachers specifically, I know Anya Pfeffer, Talon Bryant, Mark Considine, were the people that were really there for me the most, at least the teachers. And it's heartbreaking to see that um, we're talking about cutting some of these positions. Um, I debated even coming because I'm not a student, but um, obviously, I'm a part of the community, at least for a little while longer, and I care about the people here. And um, I think that um, the happiness and mental health of the students is the most important thing. And for a lot of people, this is like life saving. I know for me, um, maybe not last year, but throughout my life, uh, music and art has been what's kept me going. And I think without that, a lot of students would have a very hard time getting through, even getting through the day. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. So I see Ann Hansen, and then it looks like Michael Carr raised his hand. So Ann Hansen. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that I, I think what I'm hearing and a lot of people are expressing is that we have an intact community at Hazen that serves so many students in so many different ways in a critical time. Um, I am a Hazen Union graduate. I graduated 30 plus years ago. And um, even back then, 
Hazen was a grounding place for me. The courses that I was able to take, the, you know, the arts were really growing at that time. Um, they fortified me and they made possibilities for self-expression and self-discovery, the opportunity to go on different chorus trips, things like that, opened the doors of life beyond Hardwick, which in a very interesting way, ultimately brought me back to Hardwick to serve the community as a teacher myself. And I just feel that in this nation, in this time when there is so much um, disaffection, we really do have to think from the perspective of, of aspiration, who and what do we want to be? What do we have here that is precious, unique, and serving people and families in a time when so much else is being lost? And so I would very much um, back up the comments about really looking to envisioning what we want to be and making things possible for us to not take away what we have and the, the, the amazing people that serve our schools, staff and faculty are, are vital. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michael Carr and then Ollie Grant. Hello, it's Michael Carr. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Again, I'm on cell phone, so it's a bit more challenging. I had asked a question earlier, um, and I was um, looking at a number of documents, so bear with me as I'm sort of struggling through the, the documents and the uh, this forum. One of the things I would ask the board to look at is the uh, SU, the Supervisory Union Budget. That one, if I'm not mistaken, looks to be going up $1.37 million from last year to this year. And again, what I had asked was a question on why salaries, a line item in the SU budget is going up over $500,000. Um, I know um, the, the special ed is a component to that. That's dictated by things outside of your control. Um, I have some issues there, but I, I know that hands are tied. But the allocation back, not just to Hazen, which uh, looks to be close to 50,000, uh, those allocations to all of our uh, schools, are they're picking up a, a large chunk that's coming out of the central office. 1.37 million seems to be like a, a significant increase when we have some great folks uh, who are the face-to-face, -face, the, the students we've just heard from, talking the praises of Jim and uh, Jim Roz, Jim Lockhart, um, Leanne, um, Anna. Those are the ones that need to be um, valued. Uh, and, and I'm in uh, education as well. I know the, the value at the SU and, and working through the uh, submissions to the state and the feds, I get it. But board, look at that SU budget very hard. And I know it's difficult when the SU folks are at the same table with you and you've got to make those tough decisions, but think about the same if Jim Ross, Jim Lockhart, Anna Pfeiffer, they're all sitting at that same table when you're starting to uh, mix their positions. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like Ollie Grant and then Leo McMurdy. McMurtry. Um, so I'm the, I'm a current uh, student at Hazen. I'm a senior, so this is my last year, but I've gone to Hazen for my entire middle school and high school life, and there has been no one more impactful in that than my teachers. Um, I had the same math teacher three years in a row, and when you have someone so often, you really gain a relationship with them. And I don't know exactly whose position is, um, like, you know, <laughs> up for debate, I guess. But I know that whoever it is is going to matter a whole lot to someone. And I think that the 
relationships that we as students form with our teachers is very much a two-way street. Um, so imagining, you know, Hazen without specific teachers, imagine like putting myself in their shoes, imagining, you know, you know, <laughs> without these kids that they just formed a relationship with, that's going to be really hard. And yeah, I'm a very social person. Relationships mean a lot. Okay, thank you. Leo? Um, hi, uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Good, okay. So I'm Leo, I'm also a senior, um, and I moved here from the Boston area back in 2015, um, where I started school right in seventh grade. Um, so I've been at Hazen full five, six years, and throughout that time I have been someone along with plenty of other people I know who struggled with their mental health. Um, and a lot of aspects of school um, didn't help that much, whether it be like bullying or that types of things. Um, but the arts has been somewhere where I actually felt comfort and I felt a place where I was able to be myself and express myself. Um, without the fear being judged or ostracized. Um, I am, like I mentioned before, I'm a senior and I'm planning to go to college for um, art, specifically art and animation. And I think that part of my life has been influenced by the connections I have made and by the teachers who have really guided me throughout school and without them I don't know who I would be or if where I would be at um currently and they have been a huge part of my life and I again I genuinely do not know where I would be without them plenty of them have helped me through a lot of things that without them i don't know how i would have gone through them and again the arts is a huge part of my life and a huge part of plenty of other people's lives um and taking that way could genuinely hurt a lot of students and i um lucas mentioned something how mentioned something about how um students mental health or mental health should be uh, a priority in these types of decisions um and for me personally, and plenty of other students, um, our mental health has been impacted in a very, very positive way because of the teachers at Hazen and a lot of teachers in the arts department. So thank you. Thank you. Jason, I don't see uh, anybody else uh, on deck for a comment. That's correct as far as I can see, yes. Well, it is uh, 7.59, a minute away from the uh, stated uh, end time of this meeting. So uh, I think at this time, uh, I'll start taking steps to wind up the meeting and thank you all again for being here. Um, if you weren't here saying what you think, uh, we would be much worse off uh, in terms of uh, working on the budget. And as Jason just uh, posted in the chat room, if you have uh, additional uh, ideas and comments, um, there is the uh, link uh, to make them. So it's just turned uh, to eight o'clock. And uh, with that turn of the clock, I'll again, thank you so much for being here when you could be somewhere else. Uh, we appreciate it. And I'll call uh, the meeting uh, adjourned. Thank you all.